Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service. Wonderful to see you all here this morning. Thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, a couple of notices as we begin our service. Uh, the first is to say that uh, we've got some little leaflets to hand out for Easter. If you're interested in inviting people along, uh, there's uh, some posters up around the village. Uh, there's also a video we'll see later on that's going up on our social media. Uh, but this just uh, advertises two things. One is the, the Good Friday service on the green at 10 o'clock. And the second is the Easter Sunday service here at 10.30. Now, we are obviously meeting before then. Uh, we'll be meeting as a church on, at 9 o'clock on Good Friday morning for communion. And as we often do, uh, then at about 9.40 or so, we'll then take a walk with the cross down to the village green for 10 o'clock. So people can join us for 9 o'clock for communion, 9.40 for a walk, 10 o'clock on the village green. But these are just advertising the, the village green. And then, of course, don't forget hot cross buns, tea and coffee back here after our service on the Village Green. It'll be really good after two years of not being able to meet on the Village Green. So, so last year it was just uh, Paolo and myself on the Village Green, quickly putting up the cross. Uh, the year before it was in my garden. So wouldn't it be great that we can get there on Good Friday morning and join together. So do um, I invite people along, do plan to be there if you can. One other bit of news, uh, church fellowship news, and that's we've had a phone call this morning about our sister Kay Hanscom. Unfortunately, she was taken poorly yesterday and uh, had to go into Bedford Hospital, and they've kept her in overnight. They, Richard says they're not sure what's wrong with her, uh, but do pray for, for Kay um, and for Richard as well. Uh, hopefully, she'll be home today, uh, but yes, she was just uh, feeling unwell, and so taken into hospital, and they're looking after her, um, but they're trying to work out what's wrong. So do be praying for Richard and for Kay. We'll do that later on. Well, I hope you've got an order of service. Uh, we're going to sing uh, two songs, and in between which we'll uh, remain standing as I read the scriptures and pray. Uh, we're going to begin our service by singing, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So let's stand as we sing together.
morning, listen to these words from Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness like mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are the awesome, almighty God. You are the Holy One, the eternal, unchanging God, the almighty God who was and who is and who is to come. We give you our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's continue in our worship as we sing, You are my anchor, my light, and my salvation. It is Easter holidays, isn't it? Easter holidays, off school for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks if you go, you know, extra special, you know, opportunity to get an extra week off school. Uh, looking forward to Easter? Anyone got any Easter eggs yet? You've got, you have got some Easter eggs together? Yeah? How many? You've got one Easter egg. Have you eaten it yet? You've got one and you're holding on to it. That's good. You've got to hold on to it till, till Easter Sunday. I've got an Easter egg, and I've not eaten it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just, just appreciate that for a moment. It's been in the house a, a, a couple of weeks. Uh, it's, it's survived, mainly because it's hidden from me. But, you know, apart from that, I've been looking. But Easter, it's very exciting coming up to Easter. And at Easter, we've got some very special services. And if you come along on Easter Sunday, there might be... There may well be more Easter eggs around. Yeah, you'd have to come and find out, though. Uh, here's a little video that's up on our social media uh, that you can point people to on our Facebook page and just briefly introducing people to our Easter service. so please do point people in that direction or you can give them one of those little leaflets and invite them along to that not forgetting of course our communion at 9 o'clock 
Now later, you can unplug that one. Thank you. Uh, so, now later on in our service, we're going to be thinking about Jesus going on a journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem. But this morning, I want to tell you about a story Jesus told about someone going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Uh, we've got this person here. There he is. And he's on his way on a journey. This is a story Jesus told, and he's making that journey from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. But his journey wasn't a good one because he was, hold on a second, oh, there we go, he was attacked. He's attacked by robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him up, and they left him lying on the ground almost dead. And there he was. But good news, good news, Caleb, good news, because uh, someone came along, a priest came along. And the man was thought, oh great, the priest has come along. And the priest looked at him, and he passed by on the other side. Go on, Caleb. Then another one passed by. Let's have a look. Here comes the second one. A second religious person, a Levite, comes, and he sees the man's hand, and he passes by as well. What about the third person who comes? Um, they both pass by, and they come to him. Right, let's have a look. So the third person comes, and... This person is a Samaritan, and he was an enemy of the man who's been beaten up. So, so let's think of him in today's terms of he's a Russian soldier. So here comes the Russian soldier, and he doesn't pass by on the other side, but he sees the man, and he helps him out. He tends to his wounds, he gives him something to drink, he puts him on his donkey, and looks after him to the point where he takes him to an inn. For someone to look after him. And he gives the innkeeper some money and says, look, here's some money. I want you to look after this man until he's better, and then I'll come back, and then I will pay any extra that I need to. So Jesus asks a question then. That's the story that he told. And he asked this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? So which one of those three was a neighbor, a friend who was helpful? first one, the second one, the third one. Well, the expert in the law that Jesus was speaking to replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, I wonder over these Easter holidays what we could do to show mercy, because we've probably not got money to help someone out who's down by the side of a road. Maybe we've not got space in our homes to house someone who's a refugee fleeing from another country around the world somewhere. But maybe over these Easter holidays we can think about how we can show mercy to those in our household, maybe a brother or a sister, how we could help them or love them. So I want you to think this morning, boys and girls, mums and dads, over, these next, over this next week, what can you do to go and do likewise, to show mercy? What will it mean to show love as Jesus loves? So there's your challenge for this week. Work out how can I show mercy in my household to maybe mum or dad, to maybe brother or sister, to maybe a friend. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that we would have mercy like the Lord Jesus, that we would be kind and loving and helpful. Father, whether that's on a big scale, in doing big generous acts like the Samaritan did, or whether it's just in the small, ordinary, every day, in the words we say and the actions we take. Lord, help us, please to go and do likewise. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, we're going to sing together a song that we've uh, not sung for a while, but a song that's a, a great song to worship the Lord our God. I cannot count your blessings, Lord. They are wonderful. I can't begin to measure your great love. Chorus says, How I worship you, my Father, you're wonderful. How I glorify you, Jesus, you're my Lord. How I praise you, Holy Spirit, you change my life. And you're now at work in me to change the world. Let's stand and we'll sing this together.
us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, like the psalmist, we would wish to extol you at all times with your praise always on our lips. So we praise you this morning, especially at this time of year, for the eternal wonder of Easter. That on the cross your Son chose to exchange places with us, with each one of us. Condemned to absolve us, wonderfully he died to give us life. Our future utterly transformed, the sting of death removed. We thank you, Lord, that when we sought you, you answered and you delivered. And in this, no matter how afraid we feel, we can know that you have and you will deliver us from all our fears. For your Son is with us through your Holy Spirit, that beloved Son, offered as a sacrifice like Isaac, the watchful shepherd like Jacob, with such care for his sheep, the sovereign lawgiver like Moses, writing his law on our hearts by his Spirit. Lord God, forgive us this morning when we do not turn from evil and do good, and when we fail to pursue peace. Be compassionate on us, we pray, when we, your children, stray from your path. And remind us at this time, Lord, when so much seems wrong in our world, that every good thing we could conceive or desire is to be found in your Son and in your Son alone. For he was sold to buy us back, made captive, condemned, cursed, made a sin offering, and died that we might have life. And so in you, Lord God, we can find mercy that swallows up all misery, and goodness that swallows up all misfortune, and can in your power be content in all things, even as our hearts struggle. But equally we find solace that you are close to the broken hearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And so we bring our bruised and crushed hearts to you this morning. Be with those in our fellowship, our families and our friends who are suffering physically, spiritually or emotionally today. We pray that they might know healing, peace knowledge of you beside them and of the many in our fellowship that are suffering in these ways we pray especially for Kay and Richard as we heard about them this morning even now while they cannot come to be with us we pray that they would know your presence we pray for those who maybe are friends in the Ukraine or strangers that have filled our television screens we pray for those in Ukraine and the surrounding nations that you, the God of justice and mercy, would reflect your character in the witness of your disciples there and in your disciples here in the UK. We pray for those around the world who are suffering because of you. Places like Somalia and Yemen and Afghanistan who've fallen off our TV screens. We know that you remember them. And we would remember them in our hearts. And ask that we would be moved like the Good Samaritan. To show that we are good neighbours. Not through what we receive. But through what we give. And we're called and we do pray for our politicians. As they struggle where old world securities have been undermined in these last few years through COVID, economic failure and war. And we pray that whether they know you or not, you will break into their lives and give them the wisdom that we need and this world needs. And we pray for our community at this time in Sharnbrook. We thank you that we are able to reach out at this special time. We look forward to our Good Friday and Easter witness. And we pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing, a blessing of shining light in these dark times. 
Thank you for our children and young folk who are in our fellowship who remind us of what it was to be full of energy and youth. And we pray, Lord, that you would enter their young lives at this time of youth, that they might have a long and blessed life living and worshipping and showing the world what it means to be a disciple of you. And above all, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming here this morning, knowing that you, the God of rock-solid love, love us, love to hear the prayers of our hearts and to answer. And so in the strength of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the confidence that he gives us, we come praying to you this morning, knowing that you will answer for your name's sake and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Miles. We're going to be looking this morning at a passage in Matthew 20 about the Lord Jesus and his interaction with two people. But before we come to that, we're going to sing of him a song that takes us through uh, four aspects of Jesus' life. Uh, verse 1 takes us to his coming into the world. Verse 2, his death on the cross. Verse 3, his resurrection from the dead. And verse 4, his return, because one day he will come back. And this morning we're going to look at the Lord Jesus, but we're going to do that both in our songs, but also in our Bible readings and our time together looking at his word. So let's stand and worship him as we sing together. We're not alone, for Christ is here.
Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. Please keep that passage open in front of you this morning. Thank you, Pam, for reading. Thank you, Miles, for leading us in our prayers. We're going to just pray as we come again to God's word. Father, we thank you for your word and for this uh, story of Jesus. As we look to Jesus, may we see him clearly. May we understand who he is and may we love him. May we follow him. May we live like him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do is a question that Christians sometimes ask themselves to think, what does it mean to follow him? If I'm a Christian, a follower of Christ, I would want to ask myself, what does Jesus do so that I might go and live likewise? If I give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, then what should my daily life look like? Well, to find out what Jesus would do, we need to look to who Jesus is, and think about what it means to follow him. And these last six verses of Matthew 20, just, just give us a small insight, a little window into the character of Jesus that will help us do two things this morning. It will help us firstly to, to praise him, to worship him, adore him, to, to know who he is and just see the beauty of Jesus, our saviour. But then it will help us to answer that question, well, what would Jesus do? And help us think about, well, if Jesus lived like this, then how should I be living my life? And we're going to see that through this encounter with these two blind men. They're set up in contrast to the two disciples that we saw last week. Uh, James and John, who were asking to sit at the, the left hand and the right hand of Jesus in his throne in glory. They were looking for the best seats in the house. And now we're going to see two blind men by the roadside who see more than the disciples saw. Because they've got faith and they cry out for mercy. So have a look with me, would you please, to... These blind men who actually can see in verses 29 uh, to 31. We read there in verse 29 that Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho and a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside and when they heard Jesus going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. So we know from last week Jesus is in Jericho and now he's leaving Jericho and he's got this indescribably heavy burden on his heart. We heard last week how he said to his disciples, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be crucified. Three days later I'm going to rise again. He's got all of that on his heart and on his mind. He's just, as it were, poured out his soul to his disciples. And now he's leaving Jericho, but he's not lost his compassion for others. He's got all of that on his heart and mind. That would be consuming him, you would have thought but he's still got time to have compassion on the needs of others. If ever there was a picture of a, a burdened man, heavy laden, well, it's the Lord Jesus leaving Jericho. And yet, as we'll see, he's got compassion on these two blind men. He meets these two blind men. They're, they're in a wretched condition. They, they heard the hustle and bustle of, of the noise around them, and they ask, what's going on? So immediately finding out it's Jesus, they cry out, imploring Jesus, Take pity on us. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Now we're told in verse 29 there, there is a large crowd. There were often large crowds following Jesus, but I think even more so now because it's the time leading up to Passover. No doubt people would have been gathering from all over Israel to come to, Jer to Jericho and then on to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. 
And as the crowds are there, they try and silence these men. Did you hear that, verse 31? The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. So they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Why do they want these people to be quiet? Is it because they're looking at Jesus and going, look, we've got a, a dignified person amongst us. We've got a great man here. You, you, don't want to, you don't want to shout out at the great man. He's too busy for you. Or maybe they're just not ready to hear the claim that these men are shouting. Lord, son of David. Well, these two refuse to be put off or discouraged. Instead, they show their great faith. Their faith is, well, it's firm, it's solid, it's based on the Lord Jesus. That's who they're crying out to. They're not put off by people around them telling them to, telling them to shut up and be quiet. No, they're bold in their faith. They understand who Jesus is, because you'll notice in verse 30 and 31, twice they call him Lord, Son of David. Now last week we heard Jesus calling himself the Son of Man, and the implications of that from Daniel 7 that we've looked at not long ago. Here's another title of Jesus, Son of David. It's the third time that Matthew uses this title. He records in chapter 9 and verse 27 and chapter 15 verse 22, two other occasions where people cry out, Lord Son of David, have mercy on us. It's a bit of a key theme that Matthew's plotting through his gospel. If you remember back to your Christmas readings, it's exactly how Matthew's gospel starts. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Matthew's set up his gospels, giving us this title of Jesus. He's the, the son of David. We've heard people throughout the gospel crying out, son of David, have mercy on us. Why are they doing it? Well, there's an expectation that God is going to keep his promises. That God's going to send his Messiah, and he's going to be a Messiah who comes in the words of Isaiah 35. When God speaks about the time when his Messiah will come, then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. So in other words, if Jesus really is the Messiah, if you really are the chosen one of God, if you are the one fulfilling the promises of God, then you're the one who's able to have mercy on us and restore our sight. So do you hear in that cry, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us, do you hear the words of faith? They really believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he's able and willing to heal them. Now, by calling him son of David, they're acknowledging that God is keeping his good promises to send a king in David's line. The son of David is referring to God, God being a promise keeper and a promise, uh, a promise maker and a promise keeper. It's 2 Samuel 7, the Lord wrote to, uh, spoke to Nathan the prophet, and he said this, Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So God promises David, look, there's going to be one coming in your line that's going to be king and king forever. This promised king to come in David's line is, of course, a greater king than David. And it's these two blind men who see it. They get it. They understand it. Here in this person, Jesus, God is keeping his good promises. Here is a king coming who will be king forever. A king who's able to open the eyes of the blind, to unstop the ears of the deaf, to help the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Do you see their faith in this one who brings salvation and deliverance? And healing. <clears throat> so they're acknowledging who Jesus is, but you're also, do you see they're acknowledging their own situation? What do they say to him? Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. It's the exact opposite of James and John last week. James and John last week are, yeah, there's a seat on your left and a seat on your right, and we quite fancy those seats. These two blind men acknowledge that I've got nothing to bring you, Jesus, and I need your mercy. I need you to have mercy on me. I wonder, are you more like James and John or are you more like one of the two blind men? Do you have that sense of, well, I kind 
what you deserve. Would you come asking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus? In other words, do you see your need for a saviour, a Lord, or do you think perhaps more highly of yourself than you ought? You see, the right response to the kingdom of God is to have this faith in Jesus that says, you are the son of David, you're the Lord, you're the one who's able, but please show me mercy. I understand who I am and what I'm like. I think it's that word Lord that sticks out from verse 30 and 31. They know who Jesus is. You see, if we see Jesus as just someone who loves us, or someone who's kind, or someone who's gentle, or someone who's helpful, or someone who's a healer, well, he is all of those things indeed. But we need to see him as Lord. We need to see him as, as God and King over our lives. There's a humble reverence in these two blind men. They've got humility. They don't demand their rights. They don't call for self-promotion or self-glory. They say, Jesus, you are King, you are Lord, and we humble ourselves before you and ask for mercy. They see who Jesus is. Well, let's look then at Jesus in verse 32 and his response. He's the willing Lord who hears. Jesus stopped and called them, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. And Jesus is on this journey with, throughout the passage, it's only a short little passage, but there's lots of travelling in it. He's leaving Jericho, the blind men are at the roadside. Jesus is passing by. And it's amazing to witness that Jesus doesn't mind who you are. For in Jericho, he's going to stop with Zacchaeus, who's loaded. But he's also stopping with these uh, two blind men who have nothing. He's got time for his disciples, who are his friends, but here's some complete strangers. So it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you've, you know Jesus or you don't. Jesus has got time for them. And very tenderly, he asks them the question, what do you want me to do for you? Again, do you, do you remember the contrast with last week? It's exactly the same thing that he said to James and John. Now, you understand it with James and John because they're cousins and they come with their mum, Mrs. Zebedee, Salome, uh, who's been with him. So there's almost a, a right, a, a history. You've been with me. I know you. What do you want me to do for you? But here's two complete strangers who he doesn't know. And yet he asks them the same question and their reply is clear and direct. Verse 33 Lord, we want our sight. Lord, we want to see. You know, go big or go home. You know, they could have said, well, 50 quid would be great. You know, that would really help us. Or how about, could you just tell the crowds to show us a little bit of respect? They've been really horrible to us. And if you can tell them to be nice to us, the next few weeks are going to be quite good. No, 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 go big. We want to see, Lord, we believe you are who you say you are, and we believe you can not just change a little bit of us, but you can transform the whole of us. And Jesus is more than merciful. He's gracious here in stopping, and he's willing. He's willing to help these individuals. But I think out of verses 32 and 33, his willingness is outshone really by his, his ability to hear. Remember verse, uh, uh, the passage started, verse 29? There's a large crowd. There's lots of noise and chaos going on. And amidst all the noise and the chaos and the people, and all of the burdens that are on Jesus' heart, Jesus hears these two individuals. Maybe you think Jesus has got too many other important things to be doing. He's got a lot on his plate. There's a lot going on in the world today. And my little prayer is just, yeah, it's not a lot. Jesus does hear these two individuals. I think we need to have that, that confidence that they have, that boldness that they have, that persistence, like the persistent widow, to keep coming. They're not put off, and they come to Jesus, knowing that he's not only willing to help them, but he is, he's the one who hears them. He's a willing Lord who hears our prayers. He hears that long, agonising prayer that you've prayed this week, that you've prayed again and again and again. He hears that snatched little prayer that just got shot up like an arrow in a moment. The, the beauty of Jesus is that he hears and has time for those individuals. Again, you might feel like James and John, or one of his close friends. You might feel like 
a blind man at the roadside, complete, anonymous, unknown person who's far from Jesus, and yet he hears them, and he answers them. And that's where our passage ends in verse 34, doesn't it? That the powerful Jesus is able. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. Here we see the compassion of Jesus. He's moved with compassion. And really tenderly, he, he touches them. He could have just said, yeah, be healed, you know, just wave a hand and uh, pass him, but I've got other things to do. No, he stops and there's that tender moment. So he's actually got to put his, his hands on them. You kind you of wonder, two, two blind men by the roadside, how, how often has someone actually put a, put a hand on them? Most people have just told them to be quiet and, and turn them aside. And then we see, immediately they receive their sight. Yeah, don't miss in the midst of this the amazing miracle. Two people who are blind are now able to see. Jesus has got great power, and he used it with compassion, not to save himself, but to serve others. See the compassion of Jesus. Now their lives are not completely sorted out. They, they, they can now see, but no doubt they've still got very little money. They've got no homes to live in. They've got no employment to go to. They're still struggling, but they can now see and follow the Lord Jesus. Jesus is able. Again, perhaps we don't think he's able. Perhaps we just go, I don't know, Jesus, if you can change or influence my situation. So I don't, I don't want to get my hopes up. You know, the, the blind man could have said that. Yeah, Jesus, son of David, you're, you're well, it's theoretically possible you're able, so maybe. No, they, they, pray, they come to him with great faith and openness and expectation. Jesus, you are able, I do believe. He's able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. I love their openness and their confidence and their expectation of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is able. So you've got blind men who can really see. They can see the mercy of Jesus and they call out to him for mercy. You've got a willing Lord who hears and shows grace because he treats them with, with undeserved kindness. You've got a powerful Jesus who is able to show compassion. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus shows mercy. He shows grace. He shows compassion. What, what a wonderful saviour. If there's nothing else you take away from this morning, then go out praising Jesus for the, for the greatness of who he is. Jesus, you show mercy. You don't treat us as our sins deserve. Jesus, you show us grace. You, you offer to clothe us in your righteousness, even when we, don't, we can't earn that. Jesus, you're, you're worth following because you, you show compassion. You show compassion even when you are the most heavy laden amongst all. You see, if we've got bad sight, we'll just see Jesus as, as good and nice and helpful. But if we have good sight, we'll see him as the Lord who's full of mercy and grace and compassion. And as we praise Jesus, then we come back to that question and say, what would Jesus do? As a follower of Jesus, what am I to do? Well, well, I can't do the things Jesus did, but how can I show, how can I show mercy and grace and compassion this week? Uh, maybe on, on your front line, with, in your workplace, with that colleague who might need a bit of mercy or grace or compassion. Uh, maybe in your home with your uh, a family member, a family member who needs mercy, a family member who needs to be treated with grace, a family member who needs compassion. M maybe in our world, in, in our local community, in our global world, maybe there are times when we can act with, with mercy, with grace, with compassion. What would it look like for you to act with compassion in your community this week, in our world this week, as we think on the Lord Jesus and his mercy and his grace and his compassion, we then say, well, what would Jesus do? How am I to live? As I look on him and meditate on him, then I long to have a, a reflection of the Lord Jesus seen in my life. Oh, sure, sometimes it'll be a very pale reflection, won't it? 
be a, it'll be a glimmer of light that someone will see in me. Not, not, that, not a nice person, but a, there, there's something different here because you're a follower of Jesus. You're, you're showing mercy. You're going further than that and showing grace. You're filled with compassion, even when you feel like your, your compassion limits are just, just all taken up. What will that look like in, in your local community this week? On your front line, in your workplace, in your home, in your community, in our world? We ask ourselves the question, what would Jesus do? And we look upon him and we meditate on him and we praise him. And we go and do likewise. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that our lives would reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ just in we, we see it in a major way in him with restoring sight. <coughs> Lord, we long to see that in our own lives. Lord, help us, in, help us in the things we say this week. Help us in the things that we do. In those little everyday interactions in daily life. To be full of mercy. To be gracious and compassionate. Not because we're trying to be better people, but because we, we love you, Lord Jesus. And we long that by your spirit you would transform us to be more and more like you day by day. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, our last song looks to the Lord Jesus and his greatest expression of mercy and grace and compassion in the cross. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life our ranks shed for us his precious blood. Let's stand and sing together. Here is love. take some invitations for our Easter services and invite people along. Uh, you can stay for tea and coffee afterwards. Uh, we don't have to pack away because it's Easter holidays, uh, which is great. Uh, so do stay for some uh, tea, coffee and refreshments and time together. Let's close with a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, 
To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.